the cloud. Yeah, that's recording and I'm going to share my screen. Still people coming in. A lot of people. Okay. okay, so you should be able to see. Carla, can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see you. Brilliant. Okay, so um, hopefully you are here to um, uh, join in our um, workshop on open access publishing. If you're not, you're still very welcome here. Um, but remember, we're going to have a whole series of six different workshops. So this first one is open access publishing. The next workshop is um, on using repositories, and that really will be lots of hands on exercises. How will you put your research outputs into different types of repositories? Um, then we will have two sessions on GitHub, so the basic uh, functionality of GitHub, and then the second one will be more advanced use of GitHub in terms of using GitHub, um, which is a collaborative working tool, so how you actually use GitHub collaboratively. And then the, the fifth workshop will be um, about standard vocabularies and ontologies, and the last workshop, which will be in June, will be on fair, the FAIR data principles. And that will be quite specific to do with the FAIR data principles in Phytolith research. So anybody is welcome to come, but it will be quite specific, that one, to Phytolith research. Um, our, um, this workshop um, has been, um, and this workshop series has been developed by our um, International Committee on Open Phytolith Science. And we call our uh, oh, community, community around this, we call it uh, Open Vitalist Community. Um, you can join our community um, using these links here. We have a Slack workspace. Um, we actually have a mailing list uh, as well. Um, we have a website that you can go to, which is a multilingual website. So it's in English, Spanish, French and Chinese. Um, and we all, you can also follow us on social media. So we have Twitter and we have Facebook. And I think we also have Instagram. Is that right, Gabby? I can see you as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is right, Instagram as well. Um, so I've already done the translation, but I will explain it again. Um, if you um, want to hear, well, actually both languages, English and uh, Spanish, um, we also have the captions turned on as well, so you can enable uh, English captions to read along uh, while I'm speaking. If you want to use uh, hear the interpreter, please go to the bottom of the screen and press the globe. It says interpretation and there is a globe symbol and then you have to select Spanish or English and then you will hear that coming out of your headphones. Uh, before we start, just some introductions. So um, I am Emma Caroon. Um, I am a research associate at uh, Historic England. I'm based in the UK. Um, I'm the lead of the FAIR Phytolist project, which is a FAIR data implementation project. Um, and I'm also the chair of the committee that is organising this, um, this event today. Um, I also work as an open researcher at the Alan Turing Institute, where I work across many different domains. So we're a, we a cross-cutting uh, group. Uh, so I work on health projects a lot. I also work on things like defense and security projects. Um, and I bring an open research approach. So I do things like talking like today about open access, um, uh, helping researchers collaborate more openly. Um, do, I do a lot around reproducible workflows. And also I do a lot of uh, data science education like today. Um, I'm also, also a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute um, and also Elixir UK, which is actually a, a data stewardship um, fellowship. Um, and then next, um, our other speaker today is Jennifer. Do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, good morning um, from San Diego. Um, my name is Jennifer Bates. I'm an assistant professor at Seoul National University, um, where I'm working on archaeobotanical remains. Um, but currently, I'm in California as a visiting scholar at UCSD. Um, and that's where I'm speaking to you, obviously, from right now. 
Um, I'm delighted to be here um, as one of the committee members on the uh, International uh, Committee for um, Open Sci uh, Vitalist Science. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably enough to say about me. So I'll pass it back to Emma. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Uh, you can read, she didn't say anything about her, all her wonderful work. It's all on that slide there, but you probably all recognise her anyway. She did lots of great work. Um, so uh, just one more introduction, and that is to the rest of our committee, who you can see here on this slide. So our committee is, is one of the committees in the International Vitalist Society. We have now 12 members of the committee, and we really wanted to, when we set up the committee, is to have representation from all around, all around the world. And that's what we do have now. We've, we've got um, people from all different continents. And that's really important to us because open research um, is, is done in lots of different ways. And actually the local context that you, you have in your institute and also in your country, that has, a, that has a really big effect on how you can actually do open research. So we wanted to get lots of different views on how this type of research can be done. Um, our committee, we meet regularly um, to have discussions, um, we have several initiatives going like this training series um, and really our goal is to increase the knowledge of and implementation of open science practices in phytolith research. Um, the initiatives that are going at the moment include the FAIR Phytolith project, which was our first funded project uh, through this committee. Um, and that project is looking at how FAIR, the FAIR data principles uh, could be implemented in Phytolith research. Um, secondly, um, we are starting to develop a Phytolith ontology, which we will talk about in one of the later sessions of these workshops. Um, and then the third initiative really is this, this programme of training workshops. Um, I've also said that we, last year, we spent a long time, Carla. Yeah, Emma, sorry. You, uh, can you turn your, uh, the volume of your mic up a little bit? for the interpreters. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, it's on the maximum, but I, I think I can speak more loudly. So, um, so um, last year we um, spent quite a while building a multilingual website. Um, so as I've said, our website is in English, French, Spanish and Chinese. Um, so you can go to that and you can actually read more about our different initiatives that we are currently doing in this committee. OK, so last thing before we actually start is that um, I like to just refresh everybody's um, memory, everyone's ideas about our code of conduct. Um, we will, at the end of today's session, go into breakout rooms for discussions about what we have seen and showed you. Um, so you will be interacting with people at the end of, of this session. Um, the other sessions will actually be a lot more hands-on with actual exercises for you to do. So you will be interacting more with people during the sessions. So it's really important that we all and consider how we act with um, each other. And so the, um, we'd like to just say that what we want to encourage is um, simply being respectful and kind to each other. Everybody has different views. We often have online technological choices or problems that we have to deal with. And um, I just want to say that we really want everyone to be very respectful. Um, what we don't want to see is any sort of um, uh, harassment to anybody. Um, and if, if there's any sort of behaviour that is on the right hand side of the slide, you can see now, then um, we will contact you and we will remove you from this, this Zoom space. Um, if you are, if there are any, um, any of these actions that you're not happy about, then please do get in contact with me. My email address is on this slide and it's also in the shared document. And also uh, my colleague Celine um, is also contactable as well uh, with her email address. Okay, right. So let's start talking about open access. Um, 
what we're going to actually be learning about today in this workshop is um, I'm going to go on now to explain some of the different open access options that you have as an academic researcher. Um, and then we're going to go on to actually demonstrate um, a range of different research outputs and how these can actually be made open access. So by the end of today's session, I want you to be able to understand these differences in open access options. And I also want to, um, you to know this different range of research outputs that you can actually be publishing in an open access manner. So um, what we're gonna do is first of all, I'm going to introduce um, all about open access publishing. So this includes different types of open access publishing, why you would want to do that. So what are the benefits to you uh, for, uh, doing open access publishing? Um, we're gonna give you some examples of um, different publishing journals, different publishing, um, uh, different publishing platforms that are out there that you could use. So, so I'm gonna show you how you could actually achieve uh, different types of open access. And um, then we're going to talk uh, a bit more about the different types of outputs that you could actually publish. And once we've kind of done the first kind of session, we'll pause for um, some questions. Then we'll go on to more of what I'm calling a demonstration of open access publishing. So it will actually show you different stages you can go through to make your research really accessible and open to you. Um, other other people, where anybody really, because once everything's out there on the internet, it's not just academics, it's everybody that has access to this knowledge. Um, and then at the end, we're calling it our exercise section. And what that is today is um, for you to explore some of the links that we're going to provide for you and to have a discussion with the people in the breakout room that you go into. And then you will be able to ha uh, have We'll give you some questions to think about how you might take some steps towards making your own research more open access. Okay, so I'm trying to go slow because of the translator, so I hope I'm going slow enough. <laughs> um, so, um, first of all, what is good? Thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Um, so what is open access? So um, open access um, is a set of principles and a range of practices through which research outputs are distributed online, free of cost and um, other access barriers. So it isn't just about being free, it's actually about being accessible as well and, and the barriers to that. So there's two different types. There's gratis open access, which allows immediate and permanent access to research outputs um, free online. Um, but Libra, so Libra open access is the same. So free, perma uh, immediate, permanent access for free. But it also means that the outputs have an open license for copyright and also for free reuse of them. So the difference is that Libra has the, the open license applied to it as well. Um, the main focus of, of the open access as a kind of movement of, uh, in research is, is peer reviewed um, research articles, so journal articles. Um, and this really has um, centered, um, as I said, over uh, academic journals, um, whereas, um, more conventional, so non-access journals um, covering uh, publishing costs through access tolls, such as subscription, site licenses, um, or pay-per-view charges. Um, whereas open access journals um, are characterized by um, funding models, which do not require the reader to pay um, to read the journal contents, or they rely on public funding. Um, so really, in, in, open, in terms of open access journals, it is the author or the funder uh, of the author that pays, or the institution actually, that pays the, what we call the article publishing charge or APC. Um, 
So um, it, open access um, does not just apply to journal articles. Um, it applies to all forms of uh, published research um, uh, outputs. So, and they're called sometimes research objects as well. Um, so this can be um, peer reviewed or non peer reviewed um, journal articles. It can be conference papers. It can be uh, like PhD theses. It can be book chapters, whole monographs and books, um, research reports. It can be images that you publish online but it can also be things like data and also software. So essentially today we are talking a lot about research articles, but actually we're talking about all of your research outputs. So as I said, we're not just talking about research articles and this is the extreme uh, version of um, open access where you would open up everything you do um, on the internet. You would provide digital, uh, accessible, open copies of everything that you do. So you could do this from the very beginning of your research project. So you could actually publish your funding application if it was successful and put that on the internet. Um, you could then go, uh, you could also publish articles like pre-registration reports, which are articles that talk about your ideas and hypotheses that you have for your research before you have done your research. Um, then you can also publish uh, as you go along doing your data collection. So sometimes projects will collect their data such as on archeological sites, they will actually upload those automatically into an open access repository. So that can be done. Um, obviously, you can uh, publish your data when you've done some uh, collected the data and done some data analysis and then going through the reporting um, things like um, research articles, but also things like um, writing for wider audiences. So such as writing blogs, writing lay summaries uh, and things like that, news articles, opinion pieces, all of those would be considered open access if, if they are. Uh, put their um, accessibility, uh, accessibly, can't speak, accessibly on, on the web. Um, and then also things like reviews. So one of the new things in publishing is open peer review. So you can actually uh, open up the whole of your peer review uh, comments and have that um, published online, which actually happens automatically with some journals now. Okay, so I'm um, just going to pause a little bit. Um, so um, why would you do open access? So I've split this into carrots and also sticks. So carrots are like your thing, your incentive for doing open access. So um, really it's about if you make your work openly available, it makes it more readily visible to, and discoverable. And so then others can actually download your work. They can read it and uh, read not just the abstract but the whole of your work. Um, so if, if your work then is more accessible, it's more transparent, um, others can then fully understand the research that you're doing, they might want to reproduce your research or replicate the methods that you're using um, and use the data that you have produced. Um, so through this, the uh, thorough validation can happen by peer reviewers but also the wider community can see your work as well. And, and that leads to further validation of your work. Um, and this could actually happen at a pre-printing stage, which I'm gonna talk about pre-printing a bit later on. Um, and really this uh, review or more open review can lead to greater research quality. Um, with greater uh, accessibility and transparency of research, it makes research more sustainable. So it really means more researchers can reuse and build upon the research that you are publishing. Um, and also the more accessible your work is, it means that you're including more people in your research. So you're being more inclusive. Um, and this includes other researchers. It includes the wider scientific community and also the general public. And then this in turn allows for greater diversity in our research community and more broadly, greater diversity in those that interact with and benefit from our research.
So we're moving to the sticks now. What's telling you you have to do open access? So there are a few things now which are uh, mandating open access. The first is funders. So think about who you are funded by. Um, so funders in different countries and regions are now requiring immediate open access for publications, but also other research outputs linked to those publications. So things like data um, and code that could be used to reproduce. Um, I'm just muting someone. Um, so, um, so these funders, I know I live in the UK, uh, United Kingdom, um, our funding body, our national funding body requires this now, open access and reproducible research. Also, the European Research Council, uh, federal funders in the United States, and also the Australian Research Council, they have all got put out policies of, on open access. Um, there are also um, draft policies out there. I found one from India where there's a draft uh, policy. I'm sure there's other policies out there. So one of the things that I'm interested in today is if you know of any open access policies from your country, I would really like for you to share those with us. Um, I have left a space in the shared document. So if you want to share a link of your own country's open access policy, then please do um, share that uh, with us. I would be very interested to know about that. Um, so next, the next stick is your institution. So the place that you are doing your research, are they requiring you to do open access? So for me, uh, the answer is yes. I work at two institutions, so Historic England and the Alan Turing Institute. Both of those institutions actually require me to make my research open and also uh, the Alan Turing Institute reproducible. So that is quite a high bar uh, for research publishing. Um, I've linked on the slide here uh, the policy from Historic England. They are very interesting because they are a national body that oversees uh, archaeological research in the whole of the, uh, well, England, actually not, I was going to say United Kingdom, but that's not true, England. Um, so they, they hold a lot of archaeological material, so things like pottery and, you know, other things that you find on archaeological sites. Um, so we have a policy um, about archiving things, materials, that has to make them uh, accessible. But we also have a, um, a policy about the publications and the data that we make. And that's called our research integrity policy. And it's all about openly communicating our research. So I would say, have a look at those policies. Um, but I would also be, again, interested if, you, if your institution has a if your institution has a um, policy, an open access policy. So again, I ask if you would share that in our shared document, if you can, because um, I'm really interested to see how many institutions have these policies now. Okay, so uh, the last stick that I'm gonna talk about is um, journal policies. Um, so an increasing number of open access only journals um, are there are out there now. Um, therefore, they require you to have and pay for open access. And they also have strict um, policies about open access to uh, your other research outputs, such as data. There are also many hybrid journals now um, that don't require your article to be open access, but they do require uh, often your other um, research outputs to be openly linked to your research article. Um, one of the policies, I've, I've put a policy link um, on this slide, 
which is from um, uh, the data availability policy from PLOS, which I'm sure you've all heard of PLOS One. Um, this journal um, is used uh, by archaeologists and paleoscientists um, to publish their research. And it does require authors to make all data necessary to replicate their studies findings publicly available um, without restriction um, at the time of the publication, um, unless, so this is the bit of the caveat, unless um, there is a legal or ethical reason um, that it, it has to remain closed. Um, so um, it also says that you must write a data availability statement. So I'm going to go over those uh, a bit later in the session about what those are and what you write. Um, so, the, so the policies can be quite strict in these journals. Um, whether the editor actually then tells you to do that is another thing, because actually you still find articles published in these journals um, which don't align with the policy of the journal so it's kind of controlled a lot by the editor um, so yeah so uh, it's a good idea to have a read of these policies especially if you want to submit your work to these open access journals so um why do vitalist researchers um, need to increase open access? And this is actually really for everybody, not just open, uh, not just vitalist researchers. Um, so um, we have found um, in the in our fair vitalist project that there are very few of our publications that are, are out there published open access. Um, we looked at 100 publications from actually 50 different journals, so a wide range of journals, and we found that only 46% of them, so that's actually 46, because uh, it's 100 uh, publications, um, so 46% um, were open access. Um, so that means um, half, uh, over half, were closed access. Um, so that's definitely something we uh, need to improve. Um, we also know um, from previous work that most of our data uh, in vitalist research is found within articles or their supplementary files. So essentially, um, if um, most of our articles are closed access, this means that our data is also closed access and not accessible because you can't get to the supplementary files or the data unless you buy the journal or have access to that journal uh, through your institution. Um, and this is concerning because we are a global community and not everybody at every institution um, gets access to journals. Um, I do not get access to journals through my institutions, which you might be surprised about because I'm, I'm from the UK and we don't have, I often have to ask my colleagues to send me articles or I search for them uh, in different access options. Um, so if we actually put all of our articles that we are publishing as open access articles, then nobody in our, in our community would have uh, problems with accessing other researchers' um, articles. And, um, Another study um, which um, is really interesting is a study by Lisa Lodwick um, and we're going to talk about repositories and the use of repositories in the next um, session. Um, what she highlighted um, was that um, supplementary information and also repository links that are not persistent links, they go missing, so they change and they get lost So the data that is in these places it actually means that the data is not secure. Um, so Lisa's paper um, notes that even with open publishing in archeology, span and she was specifically talking about archeobotany, um, there are lots of different instances where data has gone missing and particularly when it's been attached in supplementary information of articles. Um, 
And she looked at uh, 256 articles from 16 different journals, um, relate, and they were all uh, archaeobotany uh, articles, uh, so those related journals. And she actually found that only 56% of articles actually shared their primary data, so raw data. Um, and this uh, also varied according to the journal. So it really did. It depended on what type of journal it was to how much data was linked. Um, and she also found that frequently when data was available, it was either in tables embedded into the text. Or, um, so that was really summary format of data. Um, or it was in some sort of proprietary format document um, attached as a supplementary information to the article and so not in an open access repository form because proprietary software is very difficult for some people to actually open those files so essentially it's completely closed to those people. Um, she also um, said that um, supplementary data tables are um, a common uh, option for sharing data, but we really have lots of problems, including their lack of curation uh, and the, the links being uh, able to, to just disappear, really. Um, let's see, do my notes here. So really, it's worth um, saying that um, we have to really consider where we're putting our data. If we are putting it into articles, it is not going to be the best fair and open publishing strategy for us to, to take uh, with our articles. Um, so I do want to talk now uh, about the benefits of increasing open access publishing. Um, and I think there are two different sides to it. There are the benefits for our wider community, and I kind of mean our scientific community, really. So um, I've already touched on that it allows people to see and validate your research uh, if it's more accessible. So this actually gradually increases the quality of research. Um, there is um, a really nice article about paleogenetics um, and them as a community really using open access, particularly open access data, to improve the quality of research within their discipline. Um, also, it increases collaboration in our community. You know, imagine you found someone's research, you know, you were able to look into the data and you thought, wow, I could reuse their data for another project. And you approach them to work with that person. And you would only be able to do that if you were able to see that person's data and see the potential of the reuse of that data set. So it also makes um, our research more sustainable because we can know about the research. It's out there, it's archived sustainably so that the next generation of researchers can reuse our work and build upon it. Um, and as I've already said, the more we give access, the more diverse and inclusive our research community then is. Um, I think we all need to think selfishly about this as well to make us do it more. So, and that's true of everybody. We have to have an incentive for changing the way that we do things. So for you as a researcher, it does increase your citations of your published research if you make them open access. I will show you a study in a minute. Um, it also means that your work is more discoverable and enhances your visibility as a researcher is essentially more people will read your research if they can actually access it. And also it means that you're more likely to get credit for your work. Other people, if they're citing you, they're giving you that credit, so you're more likely to get credit, not just for your research articles, but for your data, for your code, for the other research outputs that you put out of there as open access. So you're probably thinking, I have no evidence or I've shown you no evidence for this, but I'm going to show you now. So there are lots of studies about a higher citation rate for open access papers. And this is one study which you can look at. Um, it collates lots of studies together. 
that have looked at this citation advantage of open access. And it found that overall, there was an advantage to open access, making your paper open access. And it actually found that 76% of the studies that had looked into this did find some increase in citations. Um, so I think that is quite positive. They looked at a lot of studies. So I think that's quite, quite good evidence. The other paper that I often cite is this one, which actually looks at um, getting more citations if you link your data to your article. So this study actually found that you got 25% higher citations for a paper that included a link to data in a repository. So actually making your data openly accessible in a repository. And they looked at loads of journal articles. So it was five, over 500,000 journals they looked at, which were in PLOS or Biomed Central. So it was over a big range of um, domains. Um, so I think this is very clear evidence that the you, you do get higher citations with open access and open linking open data in your articles. Okay, I'm going to pause a minute now and just um, take a little sip of my drink. Okay, um, so, um, so hopefully I've convinced you that we should be going to improve the open access of our publications and other research outputs. I'm going to now um, explain more about the different types of open access. Um, and um, we've got this big table here, which summarizes the main points of the different types of open access that you might have heard about because um, there are lots of different ways to make research outputs open access. And what I want to highlight to you is that it doesn't always include paying as an author to make it open access. Um, this is a misconception that a lot of researchers have that you always have to pay to make your research open, but you definitely do not. Um, so if you have a look at this table, um, it shows you the different types of open access. Um, and these are often talked about as referring to journal articles, but actually they apply um, to how you go about making all research outputs accessible. So if we look from the top of the table, we have gold open access. Um, you've probably heard of this one. This is when um, you as an author, you pay a fee, uh, so you pay money to uh, make your article um, or research output open immediately um, and free to read. Um, and if possible, um, if it's available, because not always in journals, available for reuse. Um, so you would pay this, this fee to the publisher of the journal. Um, then we've got, I think I've put them in the wrong order, but then we've got bronze, um, which is very much like a, a gold open access, but it's uh, again where the author pays the fee to the publisher to make it open access, but um, it has some sort of restricted rights to the reuse of the articles and the content within it. Um, it also could be embargoed, so that means that um, it might only be open access after six months or a year, something like that, so it might not be immediately um, available through bronze open access. And this can just um, be an option that some journals have. Uh, it's normally a hybrid journal which would have that sort of option sometimes. Um, so then the next one is green open access. Um, this is where um, you take it upon yourself to make your um, article or research output openly available. Um, you often put it on what's called a preprint server. So that is for specifically for articles, or um, you can use an, a normal open repository um, and you deposit a version of your article or um, one of your research outputs. So um, next session, our next session next month, we are going to um, 
talk a lot about open repositories and most of those repositories you can put anything on there so conference papers slides blogs um, data code they will accept any sort of research output um, and the thing about green open access is it's free it's free for you to put something on there and it's free for the reader to access um, I'm going to go into more detail about these, all of these uh, in a minute. Um, and then the next, the next two are Diamond and Platinum Open Access. And this is when um, the publications are free for the author to publish, but also for the reader to access. But that cost of publication is covered by a professional society or maybe an institution. So they actually uh, will take care of the publishing cost and maintain the journal so that it's open for authors to publish and for readers to access as well. I also want to highlight um, black open access, which you don't hear about very often, but you probably know actually what it is. So this is um, where you, a researcher, would upload a final published version. So in green open access, you put a version of your article on a repository, but it's not the formatted final version of your article. Um, but with black open access, you would actually put the formatted final journal version onto a um, academic social media site, such as ResearchGate or Academia. Um, and this is actually a breach of the copyright that you sign with the journal, because you're not meant to put that final formatted version so it's been reviewed it's been lovely like made to look lovely in the formatted version um, you're not meant to put that anywhere um, then the other the other type of black open access is and the other type of black open access is um, the other type of black open access is um, when you're using sci-hub and if you haven't heard of Sci-Hub, it's um, actually illegal. It's a, it's a system where they have collated all of, they draw into this website all of the journal articles they can access. And yes, some people might use it. I'm not saying I've never used it. I won't say openly to recommend it to you because it's illegal, but um, it is illegal. So um, there are lots of different ways to access these articles. Um, by, and not to use Sci-Hub. So I will explain some of those later as well. Um, okay, trying to pause a bit. Okay, so um, how, so as a researcher, we obviously, if you're thinking about making your research open access, uh, your other, your research article or your other, um, other outputs, um, how are we going to achieve this? Um, so the first option for your research article is to pay. OK, so gold open access. Um, you might think about um, actually having because um, uh, you might want it to be there immediately. Um, so you're going to have to think about how do you cover that article processing charge, so the APC it's called. Um, the actual, this cost, it varies a lot um, from journal to journal. So it can be many thousands of dollars uh, in very high impact journals such as science or nature, um, but it can actually be as low as um, $50 in some other, other journals. So um, it's worth having a look to see in, uh, you know, what journal you want to publish in, what might be the open access uh, publishing charge. So, um, so what do you need to do to cover this charge? So um, you can obviously pay it if you've got the money. Um, you could think about including the cost in some funding that you might in your grant funding for your project. So think beforehand, I want to publish in this journal and include that in your grant application. Um, you could ask your institution for the funding. Um, some institutions have open access pots of money that you can access. Um, 
And actually, a lot of institutions now have deals with publishers for gold open access. So these mm -hmm. are um, these are what's called um, transformational agreements. So mm -hmm. universities mm -hmm. particularly are going from a system where they used to pay to read the journals, but now they are negotiating deals to pay to publish open access. So they're kind of moving towards this open access agreement with publishers and many universities and other institutions have what's called transformative agreements that um, mean their researchers can just publish in certain journals with certain publishers um, in a gold open access way. Um, so, it, so look at your institution's website, you know, library website to find out which journals you can do that for free. Um, you can also, um, as I said, you can shop around for the best deal. Um, you might not have to publish in science or nature with thousands of dollars. You could find a journal which is uh, within your costs of your budget for your, your project. Um, you can also ask for what's called a fee waiver. So a fee waiver is um, where you ask the editor to, and you say, I can't afford to pay this. And then the editor will say, OK, I will cover that for you. Um, because the other people paying the article processing charge, it includes money for fee waivers. So I think a lot of a lot of people don't actually um, know that these exist. I have to say, I've asked for one before when I was between employment and I actually said, I can't afford now. I'm not at an institution that has a deal with you would you mind paying my fee? And I was accepted. So it's worth asking if you don't think, you know, if you want to be in a certain journal, ask them, you know, I'm, if they want your article there, you know, they can give you the open access for free. There are also some, um, there are also some journals that have grants and one of them is internet archeology. span um, they have a, a grant system that you can apply for when you submit an article to them. So you can receive some, some money towards, it's a, it's a bit like a fee waiver, but it's a system of actually applying for the charge to be paid for you. I've also heard about this um, with some uh, like professional societies as well. That um, Sometimes they do have a, um, a grant you can apply for for open access publishing. So it is worth looking around to see if you can get the charge covered for you. Um, so if you don't think you can cover gold open access, because it's a lot of money most of the time, we don't all go have institutions that have these transformative agreements. So we have to think, how else can I publish my articles open access? So I think the next option would be to look for a journal that is diamond or platinum open access. So this is where um, they, uh, the institution that runs the journal or the professional body pay the cost of publishing for the author and also for the reader to access it. So I've got two examples on this slide um, and uh, you can have a look at them. Uh, they're both good journals, I think. And um, but I would like to know about more. So again, I'm asking you um, if you know of any um, diamond or platinum open access journals, uh, you can put them in our shared document, please, because I would really like to know about more journals that are going on. The ones that I have heard more about are um, particularly within excuse me, particularly within Europe, um, the, um, there's a lot of um, uh, journals that are non-English um, language journals that are, especially archaeology journals, there are quite a few of those that are diamond um, open access. So I think that's really great. Um, so please do share your links with us. Um, and um, the next is um, green open access and green open access as I said is free and um, that's great 
Um, so what does this um, actually mean? Um, it means that um, you, you would probably go the traditional route of publishing, um, but you don't want to pay the gold open access uh, charge. Um, so you, you self archive, you put your uh, a version of your article on a repository on the internet somewhere that people can access it. So you can actually do this at the stage where your article hasn't been reviewed. That's called a preprint. Uh, you can put that on the preprint servers, which I'll show you in a minute, or you can put it in an open repository. Um, but you can also um, put a post print, which is a reviewed version of your article somewhere on the internet. Um, and you can put, uh, put that as, as long as it's not the formatted version. So the, the kind of pretty version in the journal, don't put that one, just put the, you know, one that looks like a Word document you put that one in a repository so people can access and read it. Um, and the one thing you have to be careful with is just to check if you have submitted that article to a journal, you have to check their policy about green open access. And the majority of journals um, do now allow that to actually happen. So um, I, would, I would say that is a really good route if you are, um, if you are not able to pay the gold open access. So um, these are, if you want to do green open access, these are the places to do it. So there are um, preprint servers, which are on the left. I'm pointing over here, but I, I know you can't see that. It's always what I do on Zoom. And um, there are lots of preprint servers. There are lots of subject specific ones. So we've got like paleo archive, um, maybe bio archive would be appropriate, earth archive, there's a lot that's actually appropriate to sort of archaeology and paleoscience, um, but archive is the kind of original general kind of repository. Um, there is also um, the general open repository, so not preprint servers, but they take every, they would take everything, so open repositories, and next session we're going to talk a lot about these, so Figshare, Zenodo, Dataverse, and Open Science Framework, OSF it's called. Um, they all give you um, what's called a digital object identifier, so a DOI. This is a permanent link to your research output on those particular, um, on those particular services. Um, and I'm gonna just, I will go on to talk more about preprinting. So, but these, there are now um, systems of publishing that are not journals. So. One of them is um, through uh, systems like Open Research Europe or Welcome uh, Open Research. And then also there's the peer community in um, sort of system which takes your preprint, it reviews it and it recommends it. So you don't then have to put it in a journal. It's already been reviewed by a person who would normally review your article in a journal. So you've essentially gone through the whole system of uh, publication and review, but not with a journal. So, um, so preprints really is a way of getting your research out very, very quickly. Um, but the problem with that is that it hasn't been peer reviewed. So you do have to, although it's great to read other people's research that's out there so quickly, you do have to remember that actually maybe another version will come along that will be adjusted and will be reviewed out there. Um, so it does give you free access to these preprints that are out there and it's it, it's been increasing it's as you can see by this graph there's been a huge huge increase in preprinting and it, in most in most disciplines it's very it's huge in health and medical research especially as part of the pandemic uh, covid research preprinting just increased hugely to get that research out there um, but there has been criticism of some of the preprints research that was out there because it wasn't quite ready, I don't think, for publication. Um, so preprints are put out there before they're reviewed, but often and most of the time these are, are submitted at the same time to the journal process. But what can you do that isn't a journal? 
well, you can actually go through these non-journal peer review systems. So some of them are funded by funders. So um, within Europe, uh, there is now Open Research Europe. Um, and then within the UK, there is Welcome Open Research. Um, they have, um, uh, they actually use a journal platform actually called F1000, uh, which is a, a journal you can just use, but they use the same platform uh, system as that. Um, but it gives, um, it gives free um, publishing uh, to people who are funded by these bodies. And I think this will increase actually this sort of platform because it's becoming quite popular in certain domains. Um, these systems, they do require open, fully open review. So you see the comments of the reviewers and the uh, conversation that happens between the reviewers and the authors to make the final publication happen. And they also do require open data and open code. Um, this is similar to but slightly different from the peer community in, um, which again is a peer review system that isn't a journal. It's it's a it's a um, lots of different communities that have been created by researchers to evaluate preprints, and there are now sixteen different domains. There is archaeology, um, there is paleosciences, ecology. Um, again, it's free for the author to go through this system of peer review and recommendation and it's also free for the reader um, to read these articles. Um, again it has to have open data, it has to have open code if you have it and again it is a fully open reviewing system so you can see exactly what happens. Um, so with peer community in what actually happens is uh, you finish your article, you then put the article, so the preprint, onto a preprint server or an open repository. Um, you then submit that preprint using that digital object identifier into the peer community that you want it published or you want it reviewed by. Um, you put it onto their website. Um, it gets sent then to reviewers exactly the same as would happen if you submitted to a journal. Um, they're essentially the same people because it's from your community. Uh, we all work and we all, all work for journals, you know, and, and these kind of systems doing reviews. So exactly the same people, really. Um, you get the reviews back, you edit it, they accept the article, you know, if they're happy. And then what happens is you get a recommendation written by the editor on, on PCI, it's called a rec recommendation. And then that recommendation is actually published on their website. And then you format your article um, and put a formatted version onto the repository as a different version from the, the original preprint. So what it looks like, because I've actually just done this with an article, um, if you see on the left hand side here, this is the recommendation. So this is my article that I've written and you would click the button here. So this is their website. Yeah, the article isn't actually on their website, but the recommendation is. And then you would click this button and it takes you to the repository, which is um, for me Zenodo. And this is my and it's a formatted article. So it looks quite fancy, you know, like it would in a journal. And then it's um, it's here. So to be honest, this one is getting really well read. So I would say that a lot of people's criticism of this system is that nobody reads these articles or somebody is definitely reading my article on here. So for me, it's worked, but I know that I, I don't have the pressure of having to publish in high impact journals so I can use this type of system. Other people might not want to use this type of system, but it's free. So I think it's a good one to use. Right, I feel like I've talked a lot. This is my last slide before break. Um, so the last thing that I just wanted to say before we take some questions is, um, like me, I have no access, I don't have access to reading journals. So how, how do you do that if you don't have access? So these are, these are the things that I use to access 
journal articles. Um, I use Unpaywall, which is a um, Google extension that you can put into your Google Chrome browser. And um, when you go on a journal article site, it, um, it, it shows a little button on the side, like, like you can see actually here. Um, and it tells you if there is a green open access version of this journal article. There's a similar one called open access button, um, which does a very similar thing. Um, of course, you can use ResearchGate or Academia where people put their articles. Often the, the article you want might not be on there. So what I sometimes do is I request it. I request it to the author and then they often send you the ver uh, version of their article because people are pretty nice. Um, if you're really stuck or if I get really stuck, I might email the author if I know them or I might email um, one of my friends that's an academic and see if they can um, send me the article. The very last option for me is Sci-Hub. Obviously, I've never used it. I wouldn't recommend it because it's illegal, but sometimes you might have to if you can't get hold of it. Um, and yeah, so I think that's probably a good point to stop. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to say, if you have any questions about this first bit, then please put them in the chat. Please put your hand up and I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. I'm going to see everybody. So this is the point to put your camera on so we can see you. And then we will go into it. So Jennifer will take over in a minute um, and keep going. But if you have any questions at the moment, then um, shout out now, or you can hold on to your questions to the end. Don't, don't fall off because we haven't finished. <laughs> Any questions? Um, oh, I can see that we have. Oh, we have a question. Sharif. Hello, Emma. Thank you too much Hello. for your. Uh, thank you for too much for your presentation. Just, uh, um, I have a small questions. If I uh, understood uh, in the right way. You said that we can share um, photos, um, articles, um, uh, books, uh, chapters uh, via uh, open access. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, if you if you own the copyright, yes. Yes. Um, my question is regarding um, if I upload files, that files will be uploaded and reviewed before publishing by um, any expert or it will be shared and uploaded, then discussed through the open access. Of course, I'm not uh, talking about the pre-reviewed papers or articles. I uh, I spoke about um, uh, uh, photos, uh, maybe uh, some uh, paragraphs or something like articles, but not scientifically published. I hmm. spoke about photos, for example, because you know, fighters, yeah. fighters uh, have a very big problem regarding the nomenclature. We have mm. different names for the same morphotypes. So sometimes maybe you are be, if it's wrong, you I will be confused. You will be not yeah. sure from this published thing. So I need your advice if this is, will be reviewed or it will be published directly. So just with a, that's a, that's a good question. So just, if it's just an open repository, you can just put anything on there. It won't be reviewed. Um, so it's for you to, um, it's for you to make sure that it's good quality and put it on there. So that is that is a problem, I would say, and it's well well raised. Um, if you want it to be reviewed, then you have to you have to make it into an article and put it into a journal or a um, or a print one of the peer review systems I talked about. But on on an open repository, you can just put anything. There isn't any quality checking. So that's a really good point. Yeah, okay. Mariana, I think we'll just take this other question because then we'll have to move on. 
Hi, hello. Thank you for your presentation. That was very clear. I just have one question um, that's probably not yet solved, but maybe for the future. I feel a lot of pressure in terms of impact factors. Mm -hmm. um, is there like uh, a way forward in terms of this PCI or, you know, uh, open access systems that you just showed that they will start having um, impact factors? That's a really good question. I'm I'm not sure they will ever buy into the impact factor system because the, the whole idea of peer community in is it's out, it's outside that system. They do um, with with PCI. You can now put your um, art reviewed article in directly into some journals. So if you do want to have the so basically you get it reviewed for free. You put it into the a journal that will accept it and it, it can happen very quickly then the publishing into the journal um but i don't really see the point of that because the article's already available so but um yeah the it's a it's a problem uh these high impact journals the, the thing that i think is that this little thing of hope is that some um organizations and some sort of countries i know this is happening within europe they are reviewing assessment of research and making and like this is also happening happening in England with our university assessments which is called the research excellence framework it used to be that you had to have so many articles or you were forced to have so many articles in high impact journals those were the only things that were accepted as evidence or good evidence of research but that is widening to other outputs such as publishing data publishing code and software so it is changing but it's the kind of academic assessment system I think that needs to change rather than trying to bring these new systems into the high impact um, journal kind of system thanks for that question <laughs> right I think Jennifer you should take over thank you I'm gonna attempt to share my screen so give me a second Okay, and then whoop. nope, I need to sorry, I'm gonna have to undo that so I can share the so I can see the notes. Okay, Emma, let me know if I you can see that. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um we're going to now talk through a couple of examples but also discuss some of the little points around um things like the data availability statements little elements that you need to put in with regards to um uh, making your data a little bit more accessible and hopefully that slide has changed <laughs> can i just get a thumbs up from emma perfect thank you so the way that we're doing our um uh, uh, publishing our research, it's changing. We're moving away from standalone research articles that just presents our results, interpretations and conclusions, and starting to think about this reproducibility as a real issue. So just having that article by itself is not really enough. We have to start thinking about all of our outputs. So that's things like the data, the code, the method in particular, um, for example, in phytolith research, um, making sure that we are able to do things that can be used again and again. Um, making things open is not just about sharing the work itself, but sharing everything that comes around that work. So it makes it more usable, usable again, repeatable and checkable in some ways, which can be a little bit scary, but it's a really important important aspect of being an archaeological scientist or just being an archaeologist in general. And one of the things that we've been talking a lot about in the International Committee on Open Phytolith Science is tackling some of these uh, challenges relating to the way that we publish. Now, in our Zenodo um, 
space we've actually got a guide for some of the things that we've been discussing and it talks about the way in which you can upload some of your research outputs to Zenodo um, in a similar location and this is something that we're going to go into more in the next workshop which talks about repositories so this is a um, heads up um, for what we're going to do in the next workshop So thinking about ways in which we can make our research more open, more accessible, we have to start thinking about some of these steps. And the first one that we could do is start thinking about um, what is the best method for you in your particular circumstance? So that doesn't necessarily mean going instantly for gold open access, but it could also be thinking about whether or not you need to make your um, repository open access and attach that, um, making sure you think about who is going to pay the APC. Um, so that um, the cost for making it open access or is green open access more appropriate? Where you need to sort of, what is the open access that is appropriate for you and your data? So that's step one, thinking this through. Okay. Then you need to start thinking through how to link all the other outputs related to this. If this is an article or let's say an open access book chapter, you not need to start thinking it's not just about that piece of text, but start thinking about the other things that come around it. So the data, the methods, all the parts that attach to it. How are you going to make sure that they are linked safely to that piece of text? So, for example, putting them into a repository, getting the DOI and putting it in and keeping it safe and together. So in the next workshop that we're going to do next month, it'll be about repositories. So we're not going to do a huge amount on this now. But there are lots of different free open to use repositories that we can just mention here. And there's a few of them listed. So Figshare, for example, Zenodo that I've already mentioned. Dataverse is one that I've used a fair bit. Um, I quite like Dataverse. I'm familiar with its structure. Um, there's also OSF. And these are all free to use. And that's really um, important um, for a lot of us that don't necessarily have massive amounts of funding. Um, and your data doesn't have to be um, deposited necessarily openly, but it has to be deposited long term with clear arrangements for its reuse. And that, I think, is the most important aspect. It has to be safe. You have to make sure that your data isn't going to go wandering off or that the links to it are going to get lost or that um, suddenly you're going to get a notice saying that um, this dataverse is no longer um, uh, accessible. So you want to make sure that wherever you put your data, you know it's safe, that it can be accessed and that the links aren't going to die. So think very sort of carefully about this. One of the things that isn't mentioned here is that universities often have repositories that you can use. And a lot of those repositories are secure even after you leave. That data should be accessible um, when you put it into a link into the article. But check with that university repository as to its reuse. So that's really the sort of uh, heads up for next session is thinking about these repositories and how you use them and keeping your data safe. The next step really, once you've done sort of had a think about this, is actually depositing that code or method or whatever it is into that repository. Get that data in there. Start thinking about the way in which you're going to format it as well when you start putting it in, because it's all well and good to choose a repository, but you need to make sure that the data or the analysis steps or any of this attached information is in a format that not only you can use, but other people. And I'm a nightmare for this because I have a tendency to use codes that other people don't, coding of phrases that other people don't understand, like IBF and VCF. So indeterminate botanical fragment and vesicular cerealia fragment. 
And it's fine for me. I know what that means, but other people don't. So don't just upload everything and dump it. Think about the way in which other people might need to access this material that you're putting in there. And one thing in particular you might like to think about is the software through which that you're depositing this information into the repository. There's a lot of um, what's the word I'm looking for? We used it earlier, Emma. I can't think of the word. Proprietary um, software out there that can't be used in certain places or that you have to pay to use. So very often um, I have a tendency to use Excel just to put raw data in while I'm thinking. It's not the best place to put it for any kind of statistical software uh, work at all. In fact, you can't do statistics on Excel, um, but it's not great for uploading to repositories either because not everybody can access Excel. So thinking about open source software is really important and really commonly, People are using R and Python more and more. And in archaeology, it tends to be R. And it's great because it's free. You can put your work um, really easily onto it um, after a bit of a learning curve, and you can move it around fairly easily. You can do a lot of different analysis, including that statistical work. And it's reproducible, reusable, and the code can be shared. So you can show people exactly what you have done and why you have done it and how you have done it. But it is a steep learning curve. It's one that I'm still learning and I'm at the bottom of the curve. So I'm sort of got a long way to go. And you have to report that code. You can't just dump the data in the repository and wander off and say, I've done my job, you have to report the code as well to show people the analysis steps. And that's part of this transparent, open uh, data approach. But R is a really good tool to start learning um, and get thinking about, although there are others out there like Python. The next step really is to start thinking about methods as well. So I've talked a little bit about data. Methods are important as well. And this is something that's been overlooked quite a lot. And I'm guilty of this. Um, I have a tendency to say I used Medela et al. 1995's method. Um, I'm pulling that one out of my head, but this method, and I just leave it without explaining exactly what I did and the changes I made to that method. It's important to put our methods out there to explain exactly the steps we took. And that could be everything from any slight changes in that method through to the equipment that we use, because that affects the steps that we took and the end product that we come out with. So explaining the method is really important and I think one of the reasons we haven't done this often in papers is it takes up a lot of word space. But there are lots of options, as we'll see um, in a second, as to where you can put this. So, for example, we could um, put our methods into um, some of the uh, protocol places. But our methods need to be full and in detail. They need to have the transparency so other researchers understand what we were doing from the context of our sampling strategy through to exactly what we did through to the an analytical stages. And we could, for example, use something like protocols.io, which is a repository specifically for archiving the methods. So this is an example of um, a recent paper that put out the, uh, its protocols, um, and it shows how you can do this. This is literally the protocol that goes with another paper. It explains what they've done each step of the way for taking the extraction and the counting. It gives the um, the protocols.io gives a DOI, um, a digital object identifier that can then be put into the paper that you are publishing. 
So you've saved words, you've created a document that is now secure, has its own link, and you can create versions, as you can see here. So this is version two. So they've shown how they've modified this, changed it as they are working. This is a really useful approach, and it allows us to have that open science approach to thinking about not just our papers, but our methods as well. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> so this is this paper in more detail. So you can see exactly the steps that they've taken and they've put in real detail in here. It's not just step one, put it in the centrifuge. It's absolute levels of detail with how to um, replicate this at every stage with images so that you can see what they got out of it. This is a really, really nice example of how to approach making your methods open, putting them into a repository that can then be linked into your paper and saving you a huge amount of words in your article, but still providing that level of detail. So thoroughly recommend checking this out. So we've got um, a, a thought process that started with what is the best approach for making it open access for my paper or my data? Thinking through what should I put into a repository? Which repository is best for me? How to format that data? What kind of software should I put it in? Putting it into a repository, putting the methods into a repository as well. So the, fight, the next step really is to make sure everything is linked together. And that means making sure that you have both the citation for those repositories in the article or the chapter or whatever it is that you're making open access, making sure those links, those DOIs are in that paper and making sure that you have a data availability statement so that people know that this is what you have done. So what you're doing with this data availability statement is you're making it very, very clear how people can reuse your information, where things are and where they should be in perpetuity, where they should be over the long term. And data availability statements tend to be something that we overlook quite a lot. They tend to be something that we forget to do because it's that last little bit of fiddling around at the end of the article when you write your funding statement that you have to get correct and your acknowledgements that you have to get correct. And then there's a conflict of interest statement that we all tend to just sort of quickly do. And then you have to do this thing. And we tend to sort of just write something very fast and move on. But it's really important to get this accurate because there are lots of implications for it. And this is a guideline that we got um, from one particular journal. This is from uh, Taylor and Francis. And most journals will have an example of a table like this. And it's really important to get it right um, and to use an example like this and to think through it and make sure it's structured to your data. And there's a reason for this. Oops. Hang on, sorry. Um, so there's a reason for this because um, in a recent article in Nature, Emma, can I ask you to, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, in a recent article in Nature, many researchers have been, uh, they found that um, many researchers have been saying that they share their data in these data availability statements but when they checked, when they asked people to share their data, they turned around and said, oh, sorry, no, you can't have it. Or when they checked through the links that were provided in the um, data availability statements, the data wasn't available. They went to the link and it came up with a note saying, here's half of the data. Although the availability data, data statement said, here is all of the data, there were redacted sections. So the data availability statement or data access statement tells the reader where the research data associated with that paper is and what conditions there are on accessing that data. And it's that last bit that's really important 
because there are conditions on you accessing that data. And it also gives you the links. So the statement should match what you are willing to give somebody. So you should make sure that you have it in the correct section of your manuscript. It's usually before the references, but check with the journal. They might have a set, set formatting. It's usually somewhere around just before the references and it give it a very clear heading, data access statement, data availability statement. So to give a couple of examples, and of course, tailor it to your willingness to make your data available. But you could, for example, if you are willing to give everything with a DOI, say something like, the data that supports the findings of this study are openly available in, and then you give the repository name, Figshare, at, and then you give the DOI link and the reference number that it has. And you could contrast this with something like, data not available due to participant consent. The participants of this study did not give written consent for their data to be shared publicly. So due to the sensitive nature of this research, supporting data is not available. And those two different statements, giving two ends of the spectrum, are both valid because you cannot say the data is available if people did not give their consent to give that data to the public. You just have to be very, very clear on what you are willing to share and how. And of course, there's a spectrum of things in between this. So if you're submitting to a journal where you are required to give out your data, all of it, and you haven't got permission to do that, you might have to think about if this is the right journal for you to be publishing in. So this is why we're sort of making it very clear that these are important statements. Um, this is not the table. Um, thank you, Sarah, Sarah. This is not the table from Nature's um, paper. Um, if you follow the link to the Nature um, paper there, they'll go through um, some of the statements. It's actually a report on another paper. There's two of them. They both go through this data availability discrepancy. Um, they go through um, situations where the data availability and the data given did not match. This data availability table is from Taylor and Francis. And the reason I've put this one up with the examples is because it's the clearest one that I found um, of uh, examples that you can use and mold. Taylor and Francis provided the best discussion about this. Um, Nature, despite having this article, didn't actually have much discussion in their author guidelines about what you should put in your data availability statements. Um, and you can modify them as you need them. Um, and you can check with your different journals as to this kind of statements they want you to make. But I thought this was the nicest, clearest example. So once we have our um, idea of what we're willing to share, we might like to start thinking about, well, thank you Emma for putting that link up. Um, what we might like to think about what we're willing to share, we can start making our data availability statements. So these are another few examples that we might um, like to put out there. So here we have one that says, there is a data paper accompanying this research project. The DOI for it is here. Now, this is actually, I believe, potentially my paper. I could have, um, for a paper I wrote for Journal of Open Archaeological Data, if I was writing this again, I would probably restructure it and say, um, this is the data, a data paper accompanying a research project. Um, the data is from published research, the, um, published uh, uh, the, the citations for each paper can be found within the DOI below, here is the link. So I'd make it a wider statement and explain it better. So we've got another one here, which is the full data set available is at the following link and they provide a link to the data. It could be maybe expanded a little bit and say the full data set is available um, for open use to make it very clear that they're willing for it to be lent out. We have another one here that says the research compendium for this project can be found at 
link and that links through to the methods the analysis and the documentation and they've stated very clearly what's in there so it includes raw data an excel data analysis file a readme file that explains the steps so they explain what's in every single aspect of that and then we have one from um, Lisa Lodwick's paper um, and she says the data set for Lisa from this paper can be found here Again, I would suggest that that could perhaps explain that all of the publications for that, because it was a, a um, review of other people's published data, she could perhaps have expanded it like I could have done and said the links for every paper that was analysed can be found here to make it very clear that this was not new data, but a synthesis of other people's data. But at least it, these two papers, the first one and the second one, make it clear that this is stuff that you can reuse. So it's being very, very clear about what you're willing to give out, where you got the data from, and how far you are happy for it to be shared. So we have our open access decision, our data repository decision, our set format for that repository, the method as well, our discussion about um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, data availability and why we are or how far we're happy to share it out and then of course we have to think about how we're going to um, write all of this up as well <clears throat> excuse me i'm slowly losing my voice now there are other things that we can do as well as we've talked about throughout this session um, we might want to think about uh, publishing parts of the research as separate articles not necessarily just to improve our publication rate or citation rate, but perhaps to be more transparent and create that open record. So that's things like that methods paper, which could be put on, uh, on the uh, methods uh, repository, thinking about software papers. So providing your code and also providing a paper around that code to explain how it was done. There's a whole journal for archeology span in R now in which you can do that. Creating data papers, things like the JOAD paper, Journal of Archaeological Data, in which you can explain the structure of the data set that you are putting into a repository. And also creating these pre-registration and registered reports to, again, provide the structure of data and start thinking about it. So these pre-registration and registered reports are articles that explain what you're going to do in the research project um, sorry, I got the last bit wrong. They, they explain the intentions around what you're going to do. So they give that sort of uh, advanced warning of what you're doing. They explain the entire process from start to end before you begin the hypotheses, the methods, the intended analysis, and just let people know so that when you start publishing, you can sort of refer back to it and say, this is what I set out to do. Here's what I am doing. The data papers are, as I say, a way to structure your data set and provide it in a way that isn't just here is the data. You can explain, for example, in this file, I have this kind of data. It has this geographical or temporal boundary. It is structured as a CVS file that has um, the columns running this way with sites and material. So you can you can explain the structure of it. So when people look at it, it's not just data. It's not necessarily analysis. It's just explaining what it's there for and then also how it can be reused so that people aren't just looking at it as part of your project, perhaps, perhaps thinking, oh, I see the potential for this to use in other places. Very often these data papers are templated. So certainly in Joad, it's a template. Um, and it, they're quite quick and easy to write. And again, they give you a DOI that you can then link to in other papers. So here's an example of one. And this is not to toot my own horn and say it's amazing, um, but it's simply that I'm familiar with it. So this is an example of a data paper and it literally just explains the structure of it. And it was really quick to write. It's 500 words, if I remember correctly. And it just says, this is the temporal geographic boundaries of the data set. It has four CVS files. 
in this one, it has this data in, and so on. It tells you what's in each of the CVS files. And then a small statement explaining how I used it and another one saying how you could use it. So these are kind of the steps that we're going through towards making our data and our papers more accessible and open. And what I'm going to do now is just go through a couple of examples of some open access publishing, some of which, well, they have different, I'm not going to say some of which are good and some of which are bad, because they all have different reasonings for why they approach their open access um, arrangements in different ways. And again, I've got a couple of my own papers in here, one of Emma's, um, and we're not doing this because we think they're good examples or bad examples, because it's not about good or bad. It's about explaining sort of different reasonings behind them. So I will start with one that I'm more familiar with. And this is a paper that um, <coughs> uh, myself and some colleagues put out back in 2017. This was a paper that was published um, with what, having learned from Emma, was a gold open access publishing. Um, we decided to do this because, firstly, it was um, a requirement of our funding at the time. So our funding body required us that we made it immediately available open access, and it had to be of a gold standard or higher, as they put it in the funding arrangement at the time. So green open access wasn't a possibility. It had to be immediately available to the public without any embargo. Um, luckily for us, they provided us with some funding to do this, and there was an arrangement between Cambridge University and the journal. So that allowed it to be immediately gold open access. We also had to put in, as you'll... Oops, Thank you, Emma. Um, so we had to put in a corrigendum because we forgot to put the funding information in correctly, but luckily they let us do that. And you'll note that the journal and the, um, the article, the two articles were linked through their DOIs, which was really useful because that meant they didn't go missing. Now the data was not put in as a uh, supplementary information or as a open repository, which is something that I regret doing. Um, it was put in as summary tables in the main text without reference to the full raw data from the site, which I would say is not good practice. Um, but aside from that, the thing that I think is most worrying about this article is there's no data availability statement. So if I was going to go back and change anything, that would be the first thing that I would do. And I would put a statement that says the authors confirm that the data supporting the findings of this study are available within the article. And then I would go back and I would put the full repository attached to it as a DOI and then rewrite that data statement a second time. We can probably contrast this with, let's see if I can make it go to the next slide, this article, which is not at all open access. This is an example of an article that is in print format only. There is no um online version of this other than what has been put into um those uh into academia.edu research gate or any other sort of personal archiving system or university archiving system through the copyright agreements that we made with the journal itself and the reason for this is because it was part of our permit agreement that we published in this journal um, they required us to put something into this journal in relation to the research that we were doing um, at the time. So your open access decisions don't necessarily have to be linked to making everything gold open access, green open access available online. Sometimes permits might lead you to make things into print format. One thing, again, that could have been done here is I could have made the data available in an SI or a repository rather than it being in text format. And again, there's no data statement, so my bad. Um, this is an example from Emma, where she's made an open access repository and um, linked it through to her article in which she's discussing some of these open science practices. And this is a paper that has um, 
full open access. So this is um, immediately open access online, and it also links through to that DOI, to the data set itself, and to a data paper that is discussing it. So this is both the data set itself being open access and the paper itself being open access, and the two of them linked together. I'll just find my notes again. <clears throat> Now, this is another example of this sort of, ooh. oh, and thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, Emma's paper, she's just made, gave me a note said, saying that it was um, paid for by a fee waiver. Um, so that gives you an idea of some of the different ways in which um, the, the APC can be paid for as well. So this is a paper that came out really recently, um, last month, um, although the whole online print version journal issues. Um, so it's been available for a little while now. Um, this is a paper by um, Diagostini and colleagues that we've already referenced a little bit in terms of the way that they did their methods. Um, so this was done through gold open access through a university agreement with the publishers. So this is a transformative agreement. The university and the publishers have an agreement and the university kind of pays for it in advance a little bit. Um, this is a really nice example of um, some of the ways you can approach doing your publishing um, to make everything open access, if you so wish or need to. The data statement is placed in the journal. Um, it has the um, it does have a supplementary word document at the end of it, but it also links through to other outputs. There are multiple ways in which the data is made available for different people wanting to look at it. So you've got multiple links here. Let's see if we can just get it to, there we go. We've got multiple different links here. Um, and that's really critical because at the moment, the GitHub link is not working. So having the data in two different places is really useful because it means that you can actually, if one of those links fails, you can actually access it in other ways. So that's really nice to see. So GitHub's down, but Zenodo is working. So if at any one point those links just drop off, and I suspect they'll be fixed very soon, um, Carla's probably nodding at the moment, um, you can go into it and, and fix them and you can get access to the data. Ah, Carla's just said, um, it's a mistake in the link itself, it's missing the github.io at the beginning of the link. So there it is, it's, you know, if you've got a reason for the links not working, you can always go in and check there's a nodo instead, or the Word document perhaps. And this is the paper that also has that protocol.io method. So the method itself is linked into this document through a DOI that you can follow through and you can see it in another um, sort of uh, article online in and of itself. So this is a really cool example of a way in which a journal can have multiple different journal article can be fully open. <coughs> Excuse me. And here we have um, <coughs> good Lord, um, another uh, example of um, an article. Oop, there we go. Um, that's been uh, sort of made open in a different way. Um, we have um, the data has been linked in through to a GitHub. This is an, um, uh, a green open access. So it was embargoed for a short period of time um, and then made open to, the, um, to the, the public readership rather than having to pay to read it. Um, and we have the, uh, the GitHub data set. Can I say something about this one? Because this Go is like it, another evolution of um, open access. So this one, it is green open access. It actually has never been made gold open access. So you can only actually read the article if you pay for it. I think it's from Journal of Archaeological Science Reports um, or the preprint is on Open Science Framework. But this is an executable article. So if you go to the GitHub repository and you see there's a little button that says launch binder. If you press that button, it actually spins up like magic the computational environment that they did their analysis in. So essentially you can use their data, it fully brings in their data and their code, and you can explore that within the comp computational environment that they used in their research. So this is really like the furthest way, the, the sort of most complicated in terms of computational skills of what making your article open access. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like, I won't say gold standard because I, I think there's lots of other ways of doing this, but in terms of skill, comp 
occupational skills, this is like the furthest advance that you can go at the moment. And this is a really nice article by um, uh, Li Ying and Ben, um, who are really at the forefront of these like reproducible archaeology articles. And we're seeing a lot of this in the um, uh, modelling uh, yeah. realm as well. So I've got colleagues that have been doing this as well. And you can spin up their, their, their sort of their GitHub spaces and turn it into either following their model through or taking their model and changing their parameters or taking their model and rewriting the code for your model. So yeah, yeah, yeah the exactly. complications. Yeah. The, thing, the thing about this one is that to actually reproduce somebody else's work, you don't just need the data and the code, you actually need the information about the packages that they used in R or Python. So actually this creates this for you from their GitHub repository. So you should just be able to press one button and it spins up their work to be able to explore it. Like Jennifer said, explore how you could change the code and how you could change their data inputs and things like that. So yeah, it's a really interesting way of doing it. Yeah, it's very. I know cool. it's about pottery. This one, that's the only yeah. drawback. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and with that, before we get any angry frowns, I will open it up to questions. <laughs> yeah, I would say that we've we've run out a bit of time about doing breakout groups today, but I promise you, next time we definitely will do that. So I think it's better to, like Jennifer said, just have some questions now, so that we I can already see one in the chat in the chat box. So. You can put your hand up, you can put it in the chat, you can put it in the shared document as well. Um. So there is a question here that says, um, uh, I have published a paper a few years back in a hybrid journal and my article is not fully available due to unavailability of funds at the time. Now I would like to make the data and results used in the paper available through open access platforms. Is it legal from the journal's perspective? Should I make the permission of the should I take the permission of the journal to publish the data or results as open access? Ooh. Good question. That you is have a to very go. good question. So, in a legal sense, you have to go back and look at the copyright on the article um, and just see. But if your data wasn't published in it. So it isn't published with the article, the raw data, you still own that raw data. So as long as you have the copyright to that data, so you could put your data somewhere um, and get a DOI for that raw data. But what is actually in the article does have to is is the copyright of whatever you agreed. So you might have agreed that you still with uh, still retain the copyright of that article. Um, but quite a lot of the time in the past, we gave the copyright over for that work to the publisher. So just go back and check. But if it's only if it's a little bit different to what you put in the article, that would still remain your own copyright. That's and how I understand it, Jennifer. You yeah, understand and I would like say that? that. Yeah, I would also say that you can always work with the editor of the journal because you saw in one of the examples we had a corrigendum. So that's a we made a mistake and we correct things. Um, and that gets linked through to the original article. So what you could suggest to the editor is, hello editor, I'd like to be more open with my data. Could we have a corrigendum that links through with just the links to the open repository? And, you yeah. know, see what they say. Yeah, it's a good Because idea. they also want to make your article more citable and more usable and that could help them yeah yeah and also it's good to look out if you could um, maybe uh if their policy allows you to put like a pre-print somewhere or your post print somewhere because they a lot of journals they do allow that even if it's already published so it would mm. just be the version like it looks more like a word document the final version you could put that somewhere on a repository then link in your data link it to the DOI of the journal article and then it all kind of nicely links in the linking part of everything is actually really important because often on open repositories you can't find much if you just go and search but if it's linked to an article of some type you can actually find stuff yeah yeah so you could sort of reverse engineer it once you've yeah. checked the copyright on the data set make your data set open access 
then put a link through to a preprint, as, as Emma says, or even possibly put a link through to the preprint and then say article can be found online as green open access here. So yeah. you've got both the preprint option and if people can access the green open access version. So they've got both ways of doing it. Uh, AJ. Can see a hand up. AJ, have I said your name wrong? Obviously. I think the question's also in the um oh no, yeah, I was gonna no. say the question's been written yeah. out in the yeah, his question's in the um in the in the chat. So it says, uh, can you tell us a bit more about copyright issues in open access publishing? Do the authors usually retain copyright to their work? Ooh. But so that is something you have to make sure happens and yeah. it usually is a, is available but you just have to check because the publisher will take the copyright from you quite easily but often if you say um i want to retain it it's usually fine so um it's it's often an option some journals it's automatically that you actually retain it but it's not always the case it's definitely worth checking so when you do sign the copyright agreement, you'll see the uh, it tells you that the CCBY numbers and so on. And that can often be an indicator of how much copyright control they're taking away from you. Not always, but it's useful just to have a look at that as well. Um, Emma, you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong on this, but things like CCBY 4.0 means that everything is completely open access. So it could be completely yeah. reused all the way down to the point where you're going to have no control over it at all because they've taken it yeah. away from you. So yeah. checking that little bit and clicking on the link to whatever, because it, it will be hyperlinked. Click on that hyperlink when you're signing to see how much, how open it is. Is it completely open to the whole world or have they kept it so controlled that not even you have got it? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we're going to cover licenses next session. So that's something that often people don't really understand. But Jennifer, you got that completely right. The, the most the most open is CC0, which means that you, it people could do anything with your work, literally anything, and not actually give you any credit. They don't have to give you any attribution. But CC by 4.0 is the next most open license, which gives you people can do anything, but they have to give you attribution. So that really is the better one to use um, because you want to get credit for your work. So, for example, when we put Lisa Lodwick's um, images up, you'll notice I put CC re figure reproduced under CC BYO 4.0 because that's the agreement that she had with the journal. So that when she, when I want to reuse her images or her data, I have to cite her. Yeah. Are there any other questions? All oh, right, there's one from Sergio related to the question about making available a previously published paper. As a non-native English speaker, I would like to make available my papers in my native language. Would there be any problems with posting translated versions of published papers in open repositories? What a really interesting question. Yeah. Um, I would say no, because it's different from the original version because you've translated it. So, um, but I think you would have to Oh, there, Javi, well done. I only know one case that the author did not have any issue. The original was published in. Yeah, I don't I, think there would yeah. be. I suspect that that comes back again to the licensing agreement, because if they've retained full licensing agreement and it pertains to the content of the text, regardless, because sometimes it can be regardless of language. Um, so I think you need to check your copyright agreement really carefully. Yeah. Um, and again, it also might depend on the country that you're in as to whether or not. I think just check that copyright agreement. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it was all down to the legal thing. Yeah. Right, we have come to time, but if there's, is there any more questions? I'm happy to take another uh, so, question. Sorry, so that everyone knows, I'm, um, I'm writing the questions and the answers in the shared document so Thank if anyone Carla. wants to go back to it it's there and also if anyone you know if anyone thinks about something else after this session the document will be there for you you can just go in put your question in there and we will check we will keep checking the document and, and maybe come back with the answer for you 
Thanks so much, Carla. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and also, um, this is the first session of many sessions, as I said at the beginning. So our next session is um, actually on the 24th of March, so in a month's time exactly. Um, and that is about using repositories. So we will be going through, as I said, licensing. We'll be going through what different types of repositories there are, what you can put in them, how you put them in there. So we will do more of a demonstration next time and we'll get you to do things. So it would be good if you could bring along something to go into a repository. So it could be like, um, I put my like slides from talks into repositories. So that's a good thing. You know, it isn't, isn't something you'd have to sort out too much to go in there, but you could, you can put anything in there really. Um, a, a picture or you know you know image photo something like that so yeah bring something along and then um, we will put it into a repository um, I think probably we will close so thank you so much thanks to Jennifer thanks to Carla for helping out thank you also to our interpreters Anna and Maria um, I think that has been amazing to have the Spanish translation Hopefully everyone has enjoyed listening to that. And hopefully I spoke slowly enough. Um, so <laughs> uh, Gabby can give me the lowdown because I think she was listening in Spanish. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.